am I hidden doors within? Will you wait for me to let you in? So you can set me free. Your spirit is a wrecking ball. Tearing through my rebel walls One by one I watch them fall To you are all I see Lord, we cry out humbly to you just when it seems like we're getting ahead of the curve. We smash right into a big old brick wall and that puts us right back at square one. We are so exhausted, Lord. We need your mercy upon us. And it seems like all we've been doing is crying out for that very thing. But the good news, Lord, is, it's, is that you say, no matter what, we can cry out to you. So, Lord, we're going to continue to cry out. Because right now things seem not so good, but 
even in the good times, we're going to cry out to you, Lord, because you say cry out to me. And that's what we're going to do. So wherever you find yourself right now, whether it's at home, whether it's in the car, in the library, wherever, cry out to the Lord. And if you are in a public place, I I don't recommend you scream. But God knows your heart. So lift up your hands. Again, if it has to be subtle, that's all right. But lift up your hands and open your heart and cry out to the Lord because he says, cry out to me. So let's take a small chunk of silence and let's do that. to you with my heart in pieces and found the God with healing in his hands I turn to you put everything behind me and found the God who makes all things new I look to you Drowning in my questions I found the God Who holds all wisdom And I trusted you I stepped out on the ocean You caught my hand among the waves Cause you're the God of all my days Each step I take God, you are my vision. 
in my bondage. God, you are my freedom. In my weakness, God, you are my Hello and welcome to St. Paul's Church. My name is Andrew Bible and I am the media and technical director here. Appearing on the screen below is a QR code and our website, stpauls.faith. From wherever you are, you can scan that code or go to the website and you can connect with us. <laughs> There's an easy to fill out form where you can tell us a little bit about yourself, sign up for the e-note, and most importantly, send us a prayer request joy or concern, we care for you. And every week we gather together as a staff to pray over what you send to us. And as the summer is coming to an end, some people may be sad about that, but that leads to new beginnings. And, and we're ecstatic to announce that on August 22nd, our GK kids are moving back inside for worship during the 1015 service. To kick things off that day, join us for donuts, bingo, cool prizes, and more. So parents, please drop your kids off before the start of the 1015 service, as you will need to grab a registration tag. Now, in conjunction with the nursery, this covers kids from birth to third grade. We can't wait to see you back, kids. And lastly, thank you, thank you, thank you, St. Paul's. You have blessed us tremendously with your tithes and offerings. His ministry right here in Elizabethtown, Pennsylvania, is doing work all over the local area and the world. We cannot thank you enough for partnering with us. So let's go to God in prayer to thank him for what he's done. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the blessings you bestowed upon your ministry here at St. Paul's Church. We thank you for the people that you've put here to partner with us to do your work. We pray for the direction of that ministry, Lord, that it's your steps, not ours. And we are so excited to see what you have in store for us. So thank you, Lord, for providing these wonderful tithes and offerings to this ministry here, your ministry. And it's in your most holy name we pray. Amen. A corner office was his dream, more like a prison now it seems. Somewhere on that corp climb, he left his warrior behind. Now he's just a worker at a daily grind That steals his years and numbs his mind His strength is fading, his dreams are blind This is not the life he had in mind She lies awake Cause he's up all night Staring at a screen that tells him lies That the grass is greener on the other side And so she's at the gym fighting off the years To be young again and calm her fears That should never be enough for him Just as a young man catches her eye 
Now they're trapped in their own worlds and their own wars With their cell phones and their closed doors It's funny how quiet and peaceful that it seems But they're all on together In the house of their dreams Little sister, she's a 16-year-old princess Lost somewhere between the swing set and her Brand new crush's chariot waits And big brother's room's glowing with trophies that shout his name But he'd trade all of his high school fame For some backyard catch with his hero but they're trapped in their own worlds and their own wars With their cell phones and their closed doors It's funny how quiet and peaceful that it seems But they're all on together In the house of their dreams So now they're all dressed up in Sunday bests Sit up straight just like the rest And they sing the songs of peace and rest That Jesus freed give And then their kids look up as daddy stands And he takes his bride with trembling hands Brother kneels at his father's side. Princess looks in her mother's eyes. Their tears tear down the walls as daddy prays. We're trapped in our own worlds and our own wars with our cell phones and our closed doors. God only. And on this rock we'll build, on this rock we'll build the house of our dreams. Well, hello and welcome once again to St. Paul's Church. My name is Matt Skillen, and we are so glad that you're joining us in worship today for this online worship service. I have the humble joy of sharing God's word with you today. Today we are concluding what we've called a summer playlist. This is a, a message series that has brought together an eclectic song list of sorts that has looked through the book of Psalms. And together with Pastor David and, and Pastor John, we've examined several different kinds of psalms or songs in this playlist. Songs of lament and persecution. Songs of love and trust. Songs of praise. Each has reminded us of the truly remarkable, unchanging grace and love that comes from our Father in heaven. God, the creator of all things. The book of Psalms has historically served as a songbook for both the Jewish people and the early church. These would have been words that they sang and shared with one another in worship and in their communities. They were the foundations of faith formation for generations of Hebrew families. And they were the tenets of new life in the Christian church that formed after Jesus' death, resurrection, and ascension into heaven. Generation after generation has turned to this songbook in times of praise, in times of prayer, in times of crisis, and in times of quiet meditation. As we read these words, we are joining a chorus of believers, past and present, 
who have lifted their voices to God in sanctuaries and synagogues, around campfires and over coffee, in prisons and in underground churches, on slaveholding plantations and war-torn battlefields, at weddings, at funerals, and at baptisms and christenings. The Psalms have become something of a playlist of our lives too, haven't they? Well, as we've seen in this message series, the range of human emotion and human experience is captured in the Psalms, making it a very practical and easy-to-use book of the Bible. We read the translated words in this text, and we may come to the chilling conclusion that maybe, just maybe, there really isn't anything new under the sun. Hebrew people and indeed Christians throughout the ages have felt desperate in times of great uncertainty. In other instances, they've been unable to adequately put to words the kind of love that they feel for their eternal God and Creator. And at one time or another, we, along with our ancestors in the faith, have tried to convey through many varieties of worship just how much we adore and seek to serve our gracious God. Just as these psalmists have been there, we've been there too. Well, as we prepare for today's message, I can't believe my good fortune, actually. You see, as a literature teacher, I get to share a message with you based on a poem. The book of Psalms is a book of poetry, of course, but it isn't just any poem. It is a jubilant poem, a poem about the remarkable and affirming assurance that we find in our relationship to God. So I'm going to ask you to buckle in and, and get ready because this optimistic glass is always half full literature teacher is going to share with you a poem of jubilation, a poem of assurance, a passage of scripture that asserts a very powerful message indeed. It is a song of refuge. It is a song of protection. So I've shared this story a time or two in other messages that I've been able to deliver here at St. Paul's over the years, but I'd like to revisit it once again. So if you're hearing it for the first time, great. If you're hearing it for not the first time, maybe it will bring new detail and it'll feel like the first time anyway. I can remember growing up in Dublin, Ohio and attending a community church where we had a very active youth group. Uh, this youth group did, uh, like most youth groups, an overnight retreat every fall. We'd go off to a campground and we would retreat with one another to dive into God's word and to search our hearts where he could be using us more as we all searched for our calling that he had placed in our lives. One of the many things that we would do on this retreat, of course, is some team building activities out in the middle of nowhere in the woods. And uh, one of those activities that we would do was the trust fall. Friends, I hated the trust fall. I absolutely disliked it completely. There was nothing affirming or exciting or rejuvenating about it to me at all. I just did not like the trust fall. Now, for those of you who don't know what the trust fall is, trust fall is where you uh, stand on a platform with your back to your, your friends, you fall backwards, and they catch you. The trust fall. Um, you know, as I think about how much I disliked that trust fall, I think it was because, well, this activity required trust. Maybe it was because I was a newer member of this youth group, or maybe it was because I had a healthy Midwestern mistrust of people who would willingly fall backward off of a platform when there's a perfectly good ladder right next to it. I just didn't trust this activity. And in truth, I didn't think there was any compelling reason for the people behind me to catch me. You know, that may be true for you. We've arrived at a very strange place where trust is hard to find. We don't trust the media and we don't trust the politicians. We don't trust other people. And maybe we don't trust the church. This feeling of mistrust may have us searching for the places that we can go for protections, the places that we can go for refuge. Something I'd like you to keep in mind as we continue our conversation today is this. God is our divine protector. In him, we find divine peace. We all come to worship with our own set of worries, after all. 
And I think it's healthy to name the things that worry us, the things that, uh, are, that we're most anxious about. Have you ever noticed that when you name the thing that you seem to be worried about, it seems a lot smaller, it seems less worrisome. Ipsos, the international global advisory group that you often see quoted on the news today, or maybe it's in your social media feed, did a study two months ago to determine the top 18 things that people all over the world are most concerned about. What may not be surprising to you is that at the very top of this list by a wide margin, and with 47% of the people surveyed indicated that COVID-19 was their greatest worry. Um, topping out the top three, of course, would be um, the economy or unemployment along with uh, poverty. You know what was at the very bottom of the list? 1% of those surveyed said that finding credit or the availability of credit was their greatest worry. And right above that one at 2%, was childhood obesity. From top to bottom, this list of 18 broadly names the challenges of our time and could very specifically point to the things that keep you awake at night too. God's divine protection, his divine peace is present today just as it would have been when our psalmist sat down to write what we now know as Psalm 91 and it's called The Assurance of the Lord. Most recently, I've learned the greatest cure to chronic uncertainty is God's assurance. And in my recent darkest hours, <laughs> I've been encouraged by a very close friend and mentor to turn to the Psalms. And today's reading might be a Psalm that maybe you bookmark and that you turn to in your hour of need. Because all hope, all healing, rest and restitution comes from the one who created all things. Amid all that we might be uncertain about and anxious about, I also know that if one takes a moment to zoom out just for a moment, one will also find so many ways that, that God has delivered us to this day, to be in this place, to be in worship together and present in this time. So this, this rather boisterous and jubilant psalm, Psalm 91, begins with a resounding affirmation. If you're joining me with your Bible, I invite you to turn over there right now to Psalm 91. Listen to how this enthusiastic psalmist begins. It says in verse 1 and 2, You who live in the shelter of the Most High, who abide in the shadow of the Almighty, will say to the Lord, My refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Well, as this passage of Scripture opens, I want to hit pause there for a moment because I think it's important to notice who the psalm is addressed to. Notice immediately that the psalmist is talking to a specific type of person. He's talking directly to those who, quote, live in the shelter of the Most High. Another way to think of this or to say it might be, those who know God and abide in him will proclaim he is their refuge and the one they trust. I hope this initial analysis isn't getting lost in translation. Here's what the poet of the day is saying. Those of us who know God and live in him know that we have a fortress to run to no matter what may befall us in this life. You might be facing difficulty at work. You may have reached the point of no return with your spouse. You may even be facing significant medical issues. When the walls seem to be caving in on all sides, who do you run to? Who is your refuge? Who do you trust? Do you seek refuge in the one who is the most high? Because the truth is, life happens. The sin and brokenness of this world will eventually catch up to us one way or the other. You will experience some crisis in life. Some of us experience more disruption and crises than others, of course. But when it finally lands on your front doorstep, who do you seek? For those who seek refuge in God Almighty, the psalmist says, there is new assurance. Well, our poet continues by using this beautiful figurative language to describe allegorically 
what this assurance might look like. He uses imagery, by the way, that would be readily available to a largely nomadic population. Listen as these words fly off the page. Continuing in verse 3 of Psalm 91, he says, For he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his pinions, and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and a buckler. You will not fear the terror of the night or the arrow that flies by day or the pestilence that stalks in darkness or the destruction that wastes at noonday. Isn't that reassuring in some way? Do you see the beauty in the language used to describe how, like like a large protective bird of prey, God places us, a much smaller bird-like figure, under his wings. We are adorned with his pinions, or in some translations it says, we're adorned with his feathers. And it is his wings that serve as a shield. They serve as our shelter. The language is meant to be poetic and and metaphorical as the writer mentions deliverance from traps and snares and pestilence and disease. What is interesting is that you'll note that our psalmist doesn't say that we will avoid these problems and challenges, that somehow this life and devotion to God is without its issues or troubles. No, no, no. (laughs) But when problems find us, we have a place of refuge a fortress to hold on to. When we're about to reach our breaking point, when the traps of life ensnare us and we run to the Father in prayer, appealing for relief, have you ever noticed how different your problems seem when you fervently pray about them? I think I was 32 or 33 at the time. I had two very small children at home. They were, I think, not quite three and not quite one, so they were very young. Um, My wife was working nights at the hospital, and I was working days at the college here in Elizabethtown. And so we were off shift always, and we were always handing off two little babies, and our lives were really chaotic at the time. I can remember one night in particular uh, at this point in my life when Both of my kids were just taking turns overnight. One would wake up and need to be changed and fed. And just as I was putting that one down, the other one would wake up and need to be changed and fed. And this marathon went on for the entire night. I think I got about 40 minutes of sleep total. It was, I was was beat. It was awful. (laughs) At the end of this uh, night, I, I... don't know how I made it, but we got through it. And the next day, while my wife was sleeping to get ready for her shift, the next day I knew I had to get out of the house and, and just to go somewhere. And I, I had this beautiful double stroller, and the weather was kind of questionable. So I went to the, the mall in Lancaster City called Park City Mall. And uh, I just pushed them around uh, all the crowds and by the stores. We weren't shopping for anything. I just needed to walk. And I could buckle them both into this double stroller, and they were safe, and I had a moment to, uh, to recover. I can remember while I was walking, um, a little bit in a trance, but always aware of where I was going, praying to God at that moment of almost breaking, appealing for a shot of adrenaline or a jolt of energy or some sign of his assurance. While, while walking um, out of nowhere, um, another dad, pushing a stroller, appeared in front of me. Um, next to that stroller, he was also pushing a cart with an oxygen tank in it that his little daughter was using to breathe. Um, the other dad and I, we kind of met eyes and kind of gave each other one of these as if to say, I see you. And we both went our separate ways. As I reflect on that story, I don't think God was telling me, see, it could be a lot worse. But I firmly believe he was saying, no matter what happens, no matter what happens, no matter how tired you get, no matter how far down the end of your rope you think you are, I have you. 
when you're tired and weary, I have you. When you think you've reached the end of your rope, I will catch you. You see, those who call upon the Lord, who dwell in him, will say to God, you are the one I trust. The psalmist takes, up several, uh, takes it up several notches as we continue reading, as he attempts to allay the fears of those who might be reading his words for the first time or for the 50th time that day. He goes on to say in verse 7, A thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but it will not come near you. You will only look with your eyes and see the punishment of the wicked because you have made the Lord your refuge, the most high, your dwelling place. No evil shall befall you. No scourge come near your tent. For he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. On their hands they will bear you up so that you will not dash your foot against a stone. You will tread on the lion and the adder, the young lion and the serpent. You will trample underfoot. In the face of life, in the face of life, God will deliver. When I read this passage, I I wonder more directly who the psalmist is. I mean, if you are down and facing a tremendous challenge, that message might send you to new levels of hope. It might pick you up when you are feeling discouraged as you see injustice uh, unfolding in your neighborhood or in your nation. It might give you a jolt of energy to be reminded that God can actually crush evil. He can cure illness. He can do amazing things that we have never seen before in our lives. And it makes me wonder how God had moved so dramatically in this man's life. So much so that he pulls out all the stops and makes this really significant checklist, doesn't he? God must have moved tremendously in this man's life. He, he would convey so much in one poem, in one simple passage. Maybe you've lived through a miracle. Maybe you've seen with your own eyes how God has delivered you or someone you love from a tremendous peril. Maybe you haven't. Maybe the only miracles that you know about are the ones that you find in our biblical story. When we abide in God, our mighty fortress, we know that we live in him and that we are alive. That even death fails to crush us because of the redeeming love of Jesus Christ. It is in this assurance that many have found refuge in their time of need and where they can find peace in the storm. You see, in the face of life, God will deliver. Habakkuk, the ancient prophet of God to the Israelites, cries out in the first chapter of his prophecy found in the Old Testament. He he laments, asking God how long he must endure injustice and unrighteousness, how long he must witness violence and unrest in his city. Amid this turmoil, Habakkuk says that he will return to his watch post, a place where he can see and remember when God had performed tremendous miracles in the past. He returns to this place where he had found refuge in God from the storms of life as a reminder that God always delivers. And he said this is where he will wait and watch for God to deliver him once again. You see, in the face of life, God will deliver Think also of the Apostle Paul, who, when under captivity, reminded the Corinthian church that when we are pressed, we are not crushed. When we're persecuted, we are not destroyed because we are in Christ. And in Christ, we are alive. He said, let us not forget that God delivered us from sin through Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. Let us never, ever forget to remember the cross. Because in the face of life, you see, God will deliver. Where do you need to go today to remember how God delivers? 
Look, sometimes we have to wait for God's deliverance and and waiting will test our faith and endurance. And for those of you who are still waiting, maybe you've been praying for a long time for God to deliver something specific in your life. As you continue to wait, please know that he is molding your heart and he is refining you for the next thing in life because there is always a new thing. He is working on you, and he is shaping you, and he is molding you. When the waiting becomes an overwhelming weight on your shoulders, run into the arms of your father. Let his wings surround you. Our poet for today concludes his psalm with a word from God. It's a, it's a shift in voice and perspective of this poem. And while the previous list of deliverances are still ringing in our ears, the psalmist drops this brief and lovely reminder to punctuate our affirmation for today. He says in verse 14, Those who love me I will deliver. I will protect those who know my name. When they call me, I will answer them. I will be with them in trouble. I will rescue them and honor them. With long life, I will satisfy them and show them my salvation. Friends, when we are weary, when we're weary of our immediate conditions, we must not lose sight of eternity. We must zoom out. When you shift your perspective for just a second and you zoom all the way out and see for just a brief moment how this life on earth is compared to eternity in the kingdom of God, what on earth could possibly shake us? What illness could possibly bring us down? What circumstances could drop us in our tracks? That ever-present peace that comes with the assurance of Knowing who God is, he's, of course, the creator of everything that we see, everything that we don't see as well. We remember what he's done. He, he sent his only son, Jesus, to die on a cross so that we could live with him eternally. And we understand how he continues to live through us, through the Holy Spirit that dwells in you and in me and in everyone we meet. Our God is timeless. And his ways are higher and wilder than we could ever imagine. For those who know God, those who dwell in him, will say God is our fortress at all times and in all things. He is the one we trust. Well, unlike the psalmist who wrote Psalm 91, we live at a time when in the world when we've actually witnessed God in person and his name is Jesus. For some of you, you might be asking, who is Jesus? Well, Jesus was the Son of God who who died for our sins. What is sin? Well, sins are the things that separate us from the heart of God. They're the things that we do that, that go against what God would have for us in our lives. The Bible says that we all have sinned and we all fall short of God's glory and that the wage of sin is eternal death. But here's the good news. Jesus Christ lived a perfect life here on earth and died for us. He died for our sins so that we would not live in death, but we would live in eternal life. We can be forgiven of our sins. The Bible is clear on this too. It says all we need to do is ask for forgiveness. If you have never asked God to forgive you of your sins, let me invite you to to take this opportunity right now to bring your heart to him. I'm going to say a short prayer. It is rather simple, and I'm just going to ask you to repeat these words after me. What we're going to be doing is we're going to be asking God to forgive us of our sins, and we're going to invite him into our lives so that we can begin building a new life with him. Wherever you are, you could be in an office or a bedroom or a living room, or you could be listening to this in your car. If it is safe, I invite you to take a posture of prayer and just say these words after me. God, I know I have sinned. Please forgive me of these sins. I want to live for you. Lord, you know my heart. 
It is yours. It is you, I trust. Amen. Well, friends, I want to thank you for joining us in worship today. And now may the grace and peace that surpasses all understanding from God the Father, Jesus the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you today and until we meet again. Amen. Thank you.